We're ready to get started again. I'm here to introduce Dr. Richard Michael Gramley, who's been tremendously helpful in helping our time sequence for the Pioneer Valley. And one of the things that he has achieved for us in the Pioneer Valley is the carbon date for the Dedic Paleocite in 12,400 years on the floor of the lake. So the question and the hypothesis has been, the 12,400 year time period represents the end of the paleo time period, not the beginning. So that's the reason why Lester Garvin and I decided to create the shoreline of Lake Hitchcock so we could have a better idea and the sense of the hypothesis of searching the shoreline for early Clovis. So that means if the lake started, if the lake was drained by the year 13,000 years, that means from the Flint sources on the Hudson River, Kosaki, Norman Skill chirp beds is what we're finding here in the Pioneer Valley in, in the tonnage. Then they were transporting it from there to here. So the question is, did they show up when the lake was full? Or did they show up after the lake had drained? So we know they definitely were here after the lake drained because we have them on the floor of the lake. And what's really important about all this is that we've enticed, instigated, whatever, to get these scientists involved more here in the Pioneer Valley to create accountability and transparency pertaining to our Native Americans' past cultures. It's really important to, to make sure this information is out there so all scientists, whether they're pollenists, they study pollen analysis, or they study <coughs> lithics, or whatever their science is that is in relationship to the forming of the Pioneer Valley throughout its time period, that we all work together as a collaborative and it makes it easy, it makes it easier for somebody like me, the layman, to understand what's really happening in our valley. And it's really good to know that there's scientists willing to take time out of their busy schedules to come here to help uh, the, in, the, in, in the explanation of it all. So uh, Dr. Gramley has come on his own. He's volunteered, um, always he volunteers. He's always, uh, is in the scholarly mode uh, at the Diakilio site for the two weeks that were there. There was over 60 participants, and he always took time from the business of archaeology to talk to all the spectators that came with all their questions and answered their questions, and he answered it all. Like he took his stop to dig to deal with the, uh, the, the, the students, you might say. And so I find that. A, a, a gracious act because it, it makes it easier for us to become involved with science even though we're not a degree person that they treat us as equals and that's really nice. Thanks Mike. I want to uh, first uh, thank uh, Eagle Brook School of course for this uh, wonderful facility here. It's truly a great venue. I've been in many venues in my life, but not all of them perhaps as uh, elegant as this one. Also, I want to thank my colleagues who uh, helped form or convene this symposium and the uh, plans that we made a year ago uh, during the, and throughout the winter weathers, we had our meetings and I beat the path on Route 2 from North Andover here quite a bit, but uh, it's all come to uh, fruition. Now, I, what I'd like to do, uh, I'm essentially making uh, three presentations today. Uh, this one, of course, is my own baby. Uh, the next one is, uh, uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of Jason Lovett, uh, although Jason is uh, a good friend and is here today as well. But the third presentation, which was to have been made by uh, my colleague, Dennis Vesper, um, who's a gentleman farmer, uh, and a longtime paleontologist had, uh, could not occur because his brother, uh, and I said I wouldn't say this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. When you're a farmer, you artificially inseminate cattle, and his brother was in charge of that for their two farms, 
and the cow didn't like it and stepped on his ankle and broke it in two places. So uh, now Dennis is doing uh, this critical work uh, to uh, keep the herds increasing. So he couldn't be here today, but he does send his uh, apologies. Uh, those of many of you may know Dennis Vesper. Uh, he was uh, present, by the way, at the 2013 dig at the Sugarloaf site. So, although he's from Kentucky, uh, he's uh, he's all over the United States. Today, we're going to speak about uh, the uh, cultural sequence. It's not so much what we know. I have to say, it's rather what we do not know. Uh, but that's of equal interest to a certain degree. Um, you know, many of you, I think, uh, not all of you, but certainly many of you, um, have been made aware of Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley's book, Across Atlantic Heights, uh, in which they argue, it's an old hypothesis, it was tossed around in the 30s, but they have re re resurrected that hypothesis that Salutrian peoples, uh, who made bifaces, um, very, very skillfully done and kind of reminiscent of some of the bifaces that we see and uh, at a later time in the New Year uh, world. They, they are, their opinion is that it, uh, the Salutrian people made their way uh, to North America. Uh, whether they left any um, tangible roots, you might say, uh, or anything behind apart from their stone tools, um, that's a little more problematic. Uh, but in any case, this book, uh, I, I, I don't really agree with the hypothesis how, or the theory. However, uh, I agree with their right to argue it. This is how, in science, um, we get on. Uh, and uh, we, we must, we must always keep our minds open to these ideas. So um, I have this uh, book. I have this book. Is, that, is this actually working? No. Oh, no. Press the button. Oh, I see. There's a button here. You want to press this? Because I'll be walking uh -huh. around. I like to walk around. Well, the uh, green light is on. Um, Testing. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, in any case, I, I'll pass this book around. If you're not aware of it, it's an excellent read. It was published by the University of California Press at Berkeley. Um, and, and I might add, it is relevant to New England, but not to our interior area, because as we know from the Glacial Lake Hitchcock studies, that at the critical time when Salutrians may have crossed the Atlantic and come into North, Eastern North America, uh, in the interior of Massachusetts was forbidden to them by the ice. Uh, and so it's still, a, a, but it's still something, we, we must start at the beginning, if you will, with our chronology. So uh, I'll pass this book around in case you're not familiar with it, but, um, and we could discuss that at great length. Um, it's interesting to know, folks, uh, that we do have, we find from time to time, artifacts from the old world in the new world, but they came as ballast in ships. I, I have friend, a friend here today and others who have picked up uh, perfectly excellent uh, Paleolithic stone tools uh, made of English flint uh, that were, was left as ballast uh, uh, near Plymouth and around Boston Harbor. So this is not unusual. And there is a Salutrian biface that was found uh, in a pit next to a chimney place in, a, in Virginia. But it's not believed that the Salutrian left it there, but rather that someone had picked it out of ballast. Uh, so we do get this, and you know, some of it's uh, rather inscrutable, I and mean, it's not to be taken lightly. You have to look at every case independently. I have a friend um, who, uh, Larrick, uh, from New York City, uh, he lived in Manhattan. You know, the art, there's not many opportunities to do archaeology in Manhattan, but uh, he looked in Central Park, and in the northern part of Central Park, there are some trails and some rock gardens and there's a creek there and he found uh, what he thought were tools and picked them up out of gravel ballast again. And uh, he sent them to me and lo and behold, uh, he was very lucky. 
because one of those pieces was the most exquisite, real sculpture of a mammoth. And that had ended its end of that ballast, uh, and the eye was cut very clearly. I mean, it was artificial, it was a day as long. The lines were, uh, you know, uh, indicating the trunk. It was a wonderful sculpture. And the Upper Paleolithic people of 20, 30,000 years ago were extremely adept at doing minimalist sculpture. So that was an important find, but was it left by uh, someone uh, coming directly uh, from Europe? Well, no, not likely. Some British warship discharged in ballast, discharged it and at the northern part of Manhattan, and Larry found it uh, many years later. So I, that's where I think we are uh, with the salutary hypothesis. It's all very nice, but uh, I don't think it's relevant to us at all. However, we do have the possibility of finding some early Cumberland tradition materials. In the Hudson Valley, just over the mountain from us, uh, in Orange County, uh, Bob Funk and others, um, for years have been digging at this site called Dutchess Quarry Caves. And I was with Bob in the laboratory in 1966, when the results came back from Yale University for radiocarbon dating, some cracked and broken open marrow bone, that's what every thought one thought it was, from Dutchess Quarry Cave Number 1. That cave is now gone, or it's, it's been dug out. But in any case, I was there when Bob opened the much anticipated letter and I saw, I read the disappointment upon his face. Because the radiocarbon date uh, wasn't the expected 10 or 11,000 radiocarbon years, but rather it was over 12,000 radiocarbon years. And Bob agonized, that was impossible. There was nothing older than Clovis known or argued for in the Northeast, and this day, was a good thousand radiocarbon years older. How could it be? So Bob was tortured with this day. Um, it couldn't explain it. Thought maybe the caribou bones had been left by an animal scavenger and the Clovis people, or the, the people who made food points came later. But that date could not apply to the ancient occupation. Then this small cave, Duchess Quarry Cave 8, was excavated subsequently and more of these, uh, more early radiocarbon dates came from it. And, and many of them were 13,000 calendar years, 14,000 calendar years, 15,000. And they were all on animals that are either extinct or extirpated. Well, since all the dates were that old, Bob was having a hard time in, uh, in interpreting it. And he still, to the day he died, hung on to the idea that it was scavengers who brought those bones into the cave rather than human beings. But as we have looked at the artifacts that have been found in the lowest levels of Duchess Quarry Cave number eight, we realize that there are two bona fide middle or late stage Cumberland points, which I have dated to my satisfaction in Kentucky at 14,500 calendar years ago, a full 1,000 to 1,500 years before the oldest Clovis. Uh, I'm, accept I'm very comfortable with those dates and the dates that, the average of the dates for Duchess Quarry Cave number eight and stratum four and the early uh, is around 14,500 years. Interestingly, uh, a mastodon was found recently in Orange County uh, called the Tuckamoos Mastodon, and it too was radiocarbon dated at around 14,500 years. Uh, all that means is that these, the, the fauna that was well in place at that time, and if human beings were living in the area, or at least visiting it, uh, they would have had their pick and choose of animals at that period. There's no reason why we could not have these Cumberland people just cross the mountain and come along Glacial Lake, Hitchcock shoreline. But we have to know where to look. We can't be looking on the lake bottom. That's a waste of our time. 
we have to be looking and rock shelters or predictable places along the shoreline, the farther south, the better. Uh, straight over from Orange County, where Duchess Corey Cave is located, would put you somewhere in Connecticut. So it may not be in this Massachusetts section that we'll get some of the earliest Cumberland materials in the rock shelters along the strand line of Glacial Lake, Hodgecock, maybe down to the south, but we should start looking. In any case, I'll pass this book around if you're not familiar with it. This is a, a wonderful scholarly study, um, and I might add, the New York State Museum lost its way years ago. They stopped at one of the oldest museums in North America and have a, a most august uh, track record of publication, but they stopped publishing. And Bob went forward and published this book on his own via me and a couple of other books. And then shortly afterwards, he quit the museum because they weren't publishing his work anymore. So this Cumberland hypothesis, um, I've argued it in great detail uh, in numerous publications, most of which I'm, most of you people will not be exposed to because I do most of my field work in the mid-continent uh, in Alabama. I just came back from Alabama. It's so funny, you know, I grew up in Alabama and now I'm back in Alabama. <laughs> uh, in the beginning of my life, and now at the end of my life, I'm back in the state. You know, it's, it's very strange. It brings you back, so to speak. But I'm happy to be working in Alabama and Tennessee because that's where we find vestiges of the Cumberland tradition. And we feel, most of us feel there, that it goes back about 15,500 years, tops 16,000 years. And we're out set out to prove our ideas by whatever means. But you know, it's very difficult to find this early material. If it were ever so easy, we'd have already found it and, and worked it out. We have to work hard and follow every lead to find these sites. The Phil Stratton site, where I worked in Kentucky, and this book essentially is about the Phil Stratton Cumberland site, 14,500 years old, uh, very much like Duchess Corey Cave. It took me 18 years to find that site. I mean to say, I was looking for a site that had stratigraphy and these Cumberland artifacts, an open site, and, and, and the 18th year, I finally found it. And then it took 11 field seasons, over 11 years, to dig. So it, it's a, it's a long-term endeavor. I had jobs, I had to do other things. But I always found a little time to do science. So I'll pass this one around as well. You know, these ideas that we're putting forward here today, um, you know, if, if it's an idea worth having, it should be backed up with a publication. Because it, you all should be able to get that publication, uh, and uh, well, you may not agree with what's said in it, but at least you have a basis for your agreement or your disagreement. That's my responsibility to provide you the publication in a timely fashion. That's the nature of science. You know, we conduct experiments in the field. Uh, digs are experiments. And the experiment is worthless unless you report the results of the experiment. And that's what publications are, really. But in any case, getting back to this idea of Cumberland, uh, there comes a time, I argue, when Clovis developed from Cumberland. And I, and I believe it did. And I think this uh, metamorphosis took place uh, in uh, northern Alabama, southern Tennessee. That's not to say Cumberland stopped when Clovis began. But the two ran side by side. We call those co-traditions. And you say, well, how could that be? How can you have two different but related groups of people sharing the same landscape? Well, you know, anyone you're familiar with the gypsies, they share the same landscape with settled Englishmen. You're familiar with the Amish, who share the same landscape with non-Amish. It's very easily done uh, that people can inhabit essentially the same landscape but live quite differently. 
This bifurcation, the movement from Cumberland into Clovis and the coexistence as they went forward in time, was enabled, I believe, by Dog. Dog was domesticated 14 to 15,000 years ago, so it seems, in Iran. And by 13,500 years ago, I'm sure it would have entered, had entered the new world. Now imagine what dog, and if you had no domestic animals, what dog could mean to you. It could haul your sleds, it could haul your packs, you could eat it when times were tough. It was a hunting companion. It was just a companion. It provided dog hide when you needed. You know, the Japanese uh, use dog skins. Uh, we don't. I mean, I think many of us would blanch uh, at the idea of using a dog skin or wearing a dog skin. But it's done uh, in Japan routinely. So dog, the advent of dog, it, it caused, I think, some important changes. Uh, in any case, uh, here in the valley, getting back to the valley, while we may have Cumberland, early Cumberland sites along the valley edge, I would expect that we have, by the time it, uh, Cumberland changed into Clovis, I would expect to find both Clovis and Cumberland sites, later ones, on the bottom of the valley. Now, the question is, do we have a Cumberland site a lake on the bottom of the valley, and I think we do. But we can't get permission to dig it. It's very frustrating, it drives me mad. And it's right across the river from Deerfield. I'll just leave it at that. And, uh, and this is a site that strikes me as being terminal stage Cumberland tradition. Do we have Clovis sites? of the earlier type? Uh, yes, perhaps. We have just, Jason Lovett recently found a true early form of Clovis Point, arguably the oldest projectile point in the state of Massachusetts. And it was found on the Northampton Meadows down by the river near Smith College. Just know the colleges, you tell space by colleges. In any case, oh yes, well this is a little premature, but uh, we can, we, we may, thank you Jason. Um, here's a photograph of this early Clovis point, this oldest projectile point in our state. And here is a frame, we'll talk more about it in the next talk but the original of the point and a cast are in this. Careful with this now. <laughs> so, we don't yet have, or we can't be sure we have, a habitation site of this early Clovis period, say roughly 13,000 years or so, but we might have it on the Northampton Meadows, time will tell. Uh, but we almost surely have a terminal Cumberland tradition site of 12,500 year antiquity roughly taken uh, across the river. These are a bit problematical, but what we really have a lot of in this valley, to, and more than anywhere else, is we have descendant Clovis manifestations that are dated to roughly 12,400 years ago. We have the Sugarloaf site. The Sugarloaf site, I might tell you, is the largest descent, the largest fluted point habitation site in all of North America. That's for starters. Uh, it is a site that uh, probably in its heyday, uh, two to four hundred people lived there for up to ten years. They left behind enormous quantity of material. I reckon at least a million to two million pieces of work stone at that site. More than anywhere else. We have a large site in, near Bullbrook, at Bullbrook in Ipswich, Massachusetts, 
uh, is probably one tenth or maybe one fifteenth of the amount of material left at the Sugarloaf site, although it's of equal size. It was a very short term occupation, I feel. In any case, we have this in spades. And if there's anything the valley should be known for, is this Baroque manifestation, this large population aggregation where cultural things, you could expect to find ornaments and all manner of rare things in your excavations, and it's right here in our midst. Now, elsewhere in the country, there are sites of that period, uh, but never as large. I might inject at this point, lest I forget it later on. It is perhaps no coincidence that the date 12,400 years for the Sugarloaf site is also pretty much the date for the last mastodons. The large, when population has grown to the point when communities of two to 400 people, hunters, are possible, the days of the mastodon are numbered. You can't prove that human beings, uh, at least on that dating evidence, if you will, did the deed, but I think it's a very curious coincidence. Now, the Sugarloaf site is a closed site, in my opinion. Now, you say, well, Mike, um, yes, it's got fluted points, and yes, they do look like some Clovis points, but where are the prismatic blades? And those are found on early Clovis sites. Well, there are none. Because by that time, prismatic blades had disappeared from the Clovis tool assemblage. In fact, they had begun to disappear a few hundred years even before that. Also, we find ornaments at the Sugarloaf site. Bead. We found a bead and rug pigment pieces and an engraved stone. Such finds are, well, at least the engraved stone might, might not be the case, but with the beads are very rare, but they're common, relatively common, I mean, on fluted point sites of false mage. And indeed, the Sugarloaf site is roughly the antiquity of false. It's a late manifestation. Call it decadent Clovis, if you will, uh, descended Clovis, whatever you may wish to call it. But still, it's a fascinating period, and these people, in my opinion, were lineal descendants. Now, it's not the latest descendant Clovis, if you will, manifestation. We have later, we think, in this general region. And I refer to this site, the Templeton type site, 6LF21, dug by Roger Muller, who at that time was at the American Indian Archaeological Institute in Connecticut. Um, the date for this site, roughly taken, is around 12,100, 12,000 years, perhaps. It needs to be, there are more dates that are needed for it, but that's probably a pretty good guess. So fluid points in the Clovis tradition are continuing to be made uh, in our region. One would also say the Cumberland continued its presence, although as I told you, we only have this one Cumberland manifestation that we, uh, the late period that we know about to investigate. So uh, it's not as rich and, and full a record as we might hope, but nonetheless, uh, we know where to look. I'm sure there's a lot more uh, to be found. You know, um, a, few, a few months ago, I had the privilege to work with the Korbieski family in uh, North Hatfield, uh, in sight of the Sugarloaf Mountain. You know, Sugarloaf Mountain is a great landmark. And uh, so let's say in sight of the mountain. And on their property, uh, they have a small site, a curious winter camp, perhaps, a wonderful, sweet little single component, essentially single component, descendant Clovis manifestation, probably coeval with a sugarloaf site. And you know, you have to have a diachronic view of what people are doing. The sugarloaf site was a great place to live at for a while, but eventually it was not 
as good a place to live, and people had to farm out themselves over a wider landscape. So you have to have a diachronic view of what people were doing. And sites like the Korpieski site, we call it the Korpieski Amphitheater site. Uh, it's a, a wonderful natural amphitheater. And, uh, and uh, there must, they must abound uh, in the valley. And uh, Bud Driver knows of some, but I'm sure there are many in the valley. So we ought to get along and start looking for them. In fact, I'm relying on you people to find them. I can't be, I'm only one man. And I'm retired, I'm 70, nearly 71 years old. So, uh, you know, I can't be doing everything. But the point is, uh, I, if you will uh, find me something, I will certainly uh, come and visit and perhaps we could do a joint project. So I'm relying upon you to a certain extent. In any case, I want to pass this rather rare publication around. Might have been reprinted. I'm not sure, but I don't think it has. Um, the, there are numerous other reports here, by the way, that we that fill in the period uh, from early Clovis manifestations to the descendant or decadent manifestations at Sugarloaf, and here are reports that uh, uh, you know fill in this. This is the Bale report, of course a 12,700 calendar year old site in Maine that I excavated years ago. Um, here's a more modern publication about the same site. Um, here's a, public, a journal with a publication about a 12,600 year old site, Clovis, or a Clovis descendant, uh, right up here uh, at, uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, excavated by Bob Goodby, uh, and this is the uh, 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 wonderful uh, Tenet Swamp site, wonderful site. So there's lots of this type of thing. And finally, here's a great publication about the Bull Brook site in Ipswich, if you will, uh, the sister site of our Sugarloaf site right here in the valley. Now, why do I kind of want to stop at about 12,000 to 12,100 years ago? Because at about that time, or maybe a tad later, environmental changes occurred, the forest closed, the rely upon the animals such as caribou might have vacated this region, and essentially this early period came to a close. So I'll take any questions. I lose track of time up here. I don't even know what time we have here. Um, 1123. Um, we started at 10.45, I've given 30 minutes, so yes, I'm on time. Uh, is there, um, are there any questions on what I've given you? I'm more of the handout sheets, um, but um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Yes, please. Is the, uh, here's the microphone. Is the, well, I don't know how to use that, I'll just stand up and be loud. We can hear you, we can hear you very well. Uh, Good for you. Is the Cumberland age or tradition found in the western part of the United States? I'm thinking of uh, Paleo Americans coming in through the Ice Free Gap east of the Rockies, migrating south. I, this is a kindergarten level question. No, it's not it's a kindergarten the, level question. It's the first time I've heard this. And this is a, pro that's a profound, profound the first. It's a <laughs> profound question you've asked. And the answer is, it is not found in the early and middle or initial stages, but it most certainly is found in the terminal stage. And the terminal stage is the Folsom. And Folsom is the Western expression of the Cumberland tradition. And basically, Clovis in the West disappeared. And Folsom, in my opinion, reoccupied some of the same sites. But uh, no, uh, for example, in the entire state of Arkansas, I only know of one Cumberland point, and it came from a rock shelter, and it's made of raw material that outcrops in northern Alabama and Tennessee. So clearly it was brought there. But you know, the Mississippi River was a formidable barrier in that early era. 
Yes, of course, in a dry summer, you might cross and get across the sand flats. But as a normal habit, I would say, that river was running 15 to 20 miles wide. It was draining a continental glaciation, for heaven's sakes. So it was a barrier. Well, if Clovis evolved from Cumberland, why isn't Cumberland found in the west where you find Clovis? Well, because Cumberland began in the east, and it never, it, at an early date, it never made it into the west. But Clovis being a late manifestation out of the late stage of the Cumberland tradition finally made it to the West. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I see, again, I see uh, Clovis as something developed in the Eastern United States. Uh, of course, people who traditionally, people who are, have been interested in Clovis, they're, they're West-centric, all right? People from Arizona and Colorado, they don't want to hear anyone talking about Clovis being older or coming from the east. Uh, they live in the mountainous, beautiful areas. I mean, the feeling of uh, uh, the beauty of the region, the romance uh, takes over, you know. But really, uh, I find Clovis manifestations in the American West to be small scale, uh, minor, in comparison to what we have in the east. Uh, heaven's sakes, uh, in the state of Kentucky, I know every collector I know owns multitudes of fluted points, uh, uh, many Clovis points. I know one man that has more than a thousand Clovis points. I challenge you to find anywhere in the American West where there's <coughs> that type of material. The heartland for Clovis is in the East. Yes. Dr. Cranley, thank you for being here. It's always interesting when you talk. Myself and others in this room have spent their lifetime right on top of this Testing. of an archaeological site. There seems to be a strong influence that prevents it from being developed and, and evolved. And you have gone around it a few times, but maybe you don't want to answer this question. There's a powerful force that doesn't allow this valley to be explored as it should be. And I cannot understand that. Thank you. Well, yes, thank you very much for that comment. But uh, I would say to you, in counter that comment, that that's exactly what's taking place right here today. We're, we're, we're doing it. You know, it, it doesn't matter who does it. It only matters that it's done. Um, and uh, I, I myself, and my skein has nearly run out on these issues. But, uh, you know, I, if, I'm looking for protégés, uh, people to pick up the trowel, so to speak, and carry on. Uh, potential graduate students and others are people who become scholars. And so long as we foster a few people to carry the torch, it doesn't matter who carries it, you know, really. Uh, but thank you for those comments. And uh, it's in, spoken in the, uh, uh, in the true spirit of science, indeed. Any other question? Yes, sir. Just a weird question. If you were to be taking a census of North America, if you were taking a census of North America in the middle Clovis period, what would be your guesstimate ballpark figure of people that would have been living? Uh, yes. Okay. Ballpark. Order of magnitude. Well, I have to work back from what I know. And population studies like that uh, where you have parameters are exceedingly rare. Uh, and, I, and I'll apologize for my lack of data when I say that in all the European and Asian areas, that in all the digging that's been done there since the 19th century, uh, Vladimir Patulko argues there are only four upper Paleolithic sites that have sufficient excavations have taken place at them, they're well dated, and have good control of the data. <laughs> there are only four uh, that have um, promiscuities involved. So really, they're, even in the old world, uh, there are deficiencies in the data. And you need sites like that before you can do uh, some reasonable population estimates. But let's look at the Sugarloaf site again. Um, I would argue Sugarloaf and Bullbrook are six bands of six families. 
and that every band, Clovis band, is six families. And we have evidence of that at many sites in New England. That's 35 to 50 people per band. Uh, so Sugarloaf is an unusual aggregation. Uh, so it could have uh, I've roughly taken it's 200 to 400 people. But that's six bands. The question is, how big were the band areas? Now, the little part of Sugarloaf that we have dug, the stone comes primarily from the Hudson Valley. But I hear tell that there's another locus there where the stone comes is Yellow Jasper at that site, comes from elsewhere. And these bands could have come to that one place over a fairly large area, they were drawn from a fairly large area. The lithics will tell us the story. Barbara Calagero is correct in this matter. It is the lithics that tell us where people move and how many people. So let's just say for the sake of argument, since there's no other real big site like that in New England, that those six bands were all the people there were in New England at 12,400 years ago. And uh, so uh, multiply the area of New England by 25, I don't know what it is. Uh, at that er epic, perhaps, there were on the order of um, mm, uh, I don't know, I guess 40,000 people, maybe, for the continent. Um, no, not even that. Uh, at tops, maybe fewer than that. Not a large figure, really, at, at that late period. So go back in time a little farther, and it would be fewer, perhaps. Very small number, actually, I think. A yeah, very small number. And it was a good thing for the Mastodons, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it had to be a small number. We know it had to be because the Mastodons continued to exist through that entire period. The Mastodons were not killed off in any blitzkrieg manner by brutes coming from the old world. They were taken by people who were practicing the habits that had been practiced in the old world. And they lived with mammoths for a long time. But finally, they took care of the mammoths, too, in Europe. So the populations had to be small. And uh, uh, the gestation period, I mean, I, I think that the answer to your question, uh, and I'm going to leave it now, it really is, it can be answered, your question. But you'll have to take in mind the, the relation of man with other animals. And that will give you the answer. Have I answered your question? Okay, one more question. Yes, well, I'm not sure I should even ask, but what about the Ohio River Valley? I mean, nobody, you mentioned the Mississippi, but there's, I mean, I used to live in Kentucky. The main thing is the Ohio River Valley, the Kentucky River, they flow. I mean, people cross those mountains all the time. That, at a certain period of time, the Ohio River was an important barrier. You're absolutely right. Well, um, it, I think it was. At a, at, in the early and middle stages of the Cumberland tradition, it prevented anyone, basically, from going much north of that. We hardly know of any uh, or very few middle stage tradition points north of the Ohio, either in Indiana or uh, in Ohio. There are some, but very few. So it's not until the later, say around 13,500 years, that we begin to see uh, late stage Cumberland points in profusion uh, in Ohio and Indiana. Uh, and that's also the time of Clovis, the earliest Clovis. So the Ohio was a barrier for a while. Yes, it was. All right, well, um, I'm going to say thank you, and I'll see you in about two minutes for the next presentation. <laughs>